And then. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is the regular monthly open meeting of the Third Laguna Hills Mutual Board of Directors, a California nonprofit mutual benefit corporation. Today is Tuesday, December 19th, 2023. It's 9.30 a.m. We are here live in the boardroom as well as available for viewing on TV6, Granicus, and Zoom. I'd like to call the meeting to order. I think we have a quorum. Um, and we'll start today's meeting with our Pledge of Allegiance, led by Director Park. Right. Please arise. Let's do Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, of the United States, of States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, and one nation under God, individual, with the liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, that's okay, appreciate that. Now it's now time to approve our agenda. Can I get a motion to approve today's agenda? Jim moves. Uh, uh, who moved? So, sorry, I'll, I'll keep track of that. So J Jim moved, um, I'm gonna say raise a second. I saw your hand go up. <laughs> uh, uh, any um, issues with today's agenda? Any issues with approving it? Um, I'd just like to state in advance that we may address agenda item 12D a little bit out of order. It's just a, a hearing that we'll be doing. Um, so we'll consider the agenda approved. Um, now looking to approve the meeting minutes for four different meetings, and let's try to address these collectively. Can I get a motion to approve the meeting minutes of the four meetings outlined in our agenda package? Andy moves, SK seconds, thank you both. Does anyone have any suggested Corrections to any of them? All right, okay. Um, I do have a change on one for the December 6th meeting minutes. The last line of agenda item 10, um, which mentions uh, the term of uh, our newest board director, should read October 2025 instead of December 2025. So, and I believe Paul has that change. Um, does anybody have any issues approving the four minutes with the one change. Okay, seeing none, we'll consider them approved by consent as well. Moving on to agenda item five, which is the report of the chair. Um, I have very little to report today, so I'll be very, very brief. Um, and really all I want to do is introduce you all to our newest third board director, Reza Karimi. Uh, Reza was elected uh, to joined the board during a special open meeting of this board earlier this month to fill the vacancy left uh, when Kush Bada, a previous director, transferred to the GRF board in November. So welcome and congratulations, Reza. Thank you. And uh, that's all I have today. As always, thanks for listening and thanks for your support. Moving along to agenda item six, which is our open forum. At this time, members may address the Board of Directors regarding items within the jurisdiction of this Board of Directors and not on the agenda. The Board reserves the right to limit the total amount of time allotted to the open forum to 30 minutes. Each member is asked to speak for no more than three minutes. A member may speak only once during the forum, and speakers may not give their time to other people. Members not in the boardroom can also share their comments by joining this meeting via Zoom or by emailing your comments to meeting at vmsinc.org to have your message read during this open forum, should time permit. And uh, with that, Paul, are there any? Uh, yes, the spe uh, first speaker is Chris Collins. Good morning, Chris Collins, 3306Q. I'm here with an update on the work of the foundation, which is on behalf of the residents of the Laguna Woods Village who are experiencing temporary financial crisis. Thank you, neighbors. Donations to the foundation of Laguna Woods Village make a difference in people's lives. Sometimes it's hard to envision how a donation can do this, but there are many thank you notes that we receive during the year that underscore how, don how donations benefit and change lives. Donations permit the foundation to help with medical bills, <clears throat> grocery cards, hearing aids, 
dental care, electric and telephone costs, caregiver services, emergency response devices, and other matters when residents face financial emergencies. Now you can hear from some of the recipients themselves. Thanks to the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village for providing me with an emergency response device, now I feel safer and more protected in my home and everywhere else. I'm happy and grateful I, that I could turn to the uh, Foundation for help. Thanks to everyone in the Foundation for the exemplary work you do protecting and caring for your neighbors. My appreciation and gratitude for the Foundation for their generosity. The Stater Brothers gift cards could not have come at a better time. Thank you. We are writing just to express our sincere gratitude for the gift of paying our very large Southern California Edison bill. Thank you is not enough, but it's all we have at this time. You helped us at a very low point and lifted a huge weight off our shoulders. We will pray for all the donor, donors and staff, and we also pray to be able to pay it forward or back someday. Thank you for helping me with dental problems. This was a big step for me with my dental health care. Thank you so much for caring so much and helping me with much needed respite care. You are awesome. I can hear, I can hear, thank you. Getting my hearing aids has changed my life and I am so appreciative. I am in my 90s, I live alone and I have no income. So you can imagine what this has done for me. Thank you again. If you have any questions about the foundation or need assistance, that we can provide, please call the foundation at 949-268-2246 or the foundation at comline.com. And for more information, you can also go to our website, which is foundationoflagunawoodsvillage.org. Please note that donations can always be made using PayPal on the foundation website. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, our next speaker is Mr. Doug Gibson. Good morning, Doug Gibson, 5289. Uh, Happy New Year to everybody. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the last star area. Kind of had a very nice meeting in October, and Sabone and three of the directors came and I had, uh, answered lots of good questions and a lot of good feedback that came as a result of that. So, with Mark's meetings on the, what do you call those neighborhood watch things, or you do each Wednesday, after Wednesday? Just where you invite people to come and sling the bull with you. Uh, <laughs> the town halls. Good. Anyway, those seem to be a very effective way for us in the community to get about it. One, um, other than thanking you for all your efforts and the new people that are on the board, that it's an important part that you're doing here. I had a unique situation happen, four-third mutual, last three weeks ago. My wife, as I came on home, said the front electrical part of our apartment, or our, our residence, doesn't have any contact. And so she had checked the circuit breakers and done a few things that we normally would do on that. So I went and completely did a review of what she had done, plus some other things on it, and still couldn't get the uh, power to basically the floor manner and some of the exterior and interior part of that. And this was on a Friday afternoon, about 2 o'clock, 2 or 3 o'clock. So aware of the uh, third mutual hard services and everything else, I went immediately to the Globe and bought a couple handymen to see with a little bit more expertise on trying to get our electrical problems on a Friday afternoon back to situation. First guy didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. Second guy tried everything basically that we had tried, plus a few things, and still couldn't correct the problem. Out of frustration, knowing it was Friday afternoon, I called into resident services to see if there was anything within the BMS situation that could get somebody out to get this corrected. And one of the interesting things that part of the circuits that didn't work was where the refrigerator or the freezer in the garage was. And that ended up, we ran with an extension cord and everything else. But I called into resident services and was told, no, we don't service third mutual with electrical problems. As we're all aware of, the water goes off, the trees fall on the streets, and things like that. There's immediate response, which is very, very good. And I think all of us have had some of that happen to it and everything else. But I was told that the earlier they could get somebody electrical out would be maybe a week and a half. So 
so I said, thank you, I understand, and went from there. I called the third handyman. Fortunately, I was lucky because this guy came on out in about 15 minutes, corrected the problem, and it's been corrected you know, three or four weeks since there. Because of a lot of people that are on CPAS, other type of, of electrical situations in our third mutual manners, so I'm wondering if maybe the board could take another look at maybe incorporating that part to handle emergency situations, not the everyday type of thing, but emergency situations where we couldn't get hold of somebody in a timely manner. So I, I believe that's the way it's set on up, but if you would take a look at it, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Happy New Year. Thank you. All right, our final speaker is Ms. Carol Moore. Good morning. I'm here to thank you. It's that time of the year when I, it's time for us to look at each one of you is a very bright, capable person, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate that you decided to spend your time here because you could have been doing a lot of other things. You're getting no money, and you're giving your time, and I want to tell you I very much appreciate each one of you and what you've done, and I want to just recall some of the things that you have taken care of and how much I appreciate that, and others. I'm not the only person. Um, the legal problem, you really put some effort into it. Wow, you guys are awesome. You are spectacular. I, I am so happy with the, the job that I'm getting. I live in third, so I can't account for everyone's home. But I want to tell you, the landscape people are hardworking, industrious, and helpful. I may not like everything the way they do it, but they care, and, I, and, I, and it means a lot to me to live in a community and have people serving on a board who care. Thank you so much, and I, I, can't, I feel like I can't say enough about it, but at any rate, uh, once again, I just want you to know that it's not just me. We understand that you have difficulty with issues that sometimes don't have easy solutions, and yet you stick with it. Thank you very much, and have a wonderful holiday. Thank you. There are no more member comments. Okay, thank you. All right, any um, board members have any thoughts or, that they want to share with regards to any of those comments? Okay, uh, yes, Moon? Yeah. The emergency situation is a very serious matter. And uh, if we do not have a perfect uh, and a complete one, we should be, you know, talking about setting up so for instance, electricity, a lot of people are depending on just not heating, cooking, but sometimes uh, medical treatment, medical things. So I think those are very important points. If we do not have it, I want to discuss it, and we should set it up. I agree. Thank you. So uh, we'll work with staff and make sure that gets on, on one of our agendas of our board meetings or committee meetings and um, make sure we understand the situation and address it and uh, share the results with our members. All right. Seeing nothing else. All right. Uh, uh, moving on to agenda item eight. Uh, to most of our monthly board meetings this year, we've been adding a department update segment where one of the leaders of VMS provides a short presentation about their organization. Um, however, today we don't have one, I guess the holiday, so we'll pick that up again in January and move on now to agenda item nine, which is our CEO report. Siobhan. Thank you, Honorable President, members of the board. This morning I would like to share some key village updates with you. I'm waiting for, there we go. As we head into the holiday season, I want to remind our residents of the confidential services available through our social services division, as shown on the screen before you. This includes comprehensive in-home assessments, resources and referrals to any number of resources that are available throughout Orange County, support groups, educational seminars, short and long-term care planning, counseling services, social isolation prevention, and the cognitive health program. If anyone is in need of social services, please call 949-597 4267, and again, this is a very confidential service. Also, a reminder for residents to register their holiday guests ahead of time 
Don't keep your friends and family waiting at the gates this holiday season. We encourage everyone to use Dwelling Live. Dwelling Live is the easiest, fastest way to welcome friends and family to the village. The app's user-friendly interface allows residents to send guests and vendors passes via email 24 hours a day using their smartphones, tablets, or computers. Visit lagunawoodsvillage.com forward slash passes to register or log in. If you have not received an email with login instructions or do not know the email on file with resident services, please email resident services at residentservices at vmsinc.org or call 949-597-4600 for assistance. You can download the Dwelling Live app at the App Store or Google Play. Residents may also call gate clearance at 949-597-4301. But again, we encourage use of the electronic system. Given the recent power outage in the Gate 14 area, we also want to remind residents of key Southern California Edison contacts. To ensure Edison customers have information at their fingertips, the following is a list of key SCE contact information. You can visit SCE.com for general Edison information. Their customer service support is available at 800-655-4555. We encourage all residents to register at SCE.com forward slash outage center to receive outage alerts and view the outage map. Outage information is also available via telephone at 800-611-1911. Edison also offers a critical care backup battery program. This provides eligible customers with a free portable backup battery to power a medical device in the event of a power outage. The link to this is sce.com forward slash outage center forward slash customer resources and support forward slash critical care backup battery program. And this follows what Director Yoon was saying as well as Doug Gibson. For information about emergency and maintenance and rotating outages, you can visit the Outage Center on the SCE website. Edison also provides great information about emergency preparedness as planning ahead is the best way to ensure everyone's safety until power is restored. Again, you can look at the Outage Center on the SCE website and the Preparing for Outages section. Edison also offers a medical baseline allowance program. This provides electricity at the lowest baseline rate to help offset the cost of operating medical equipment and automatically contacts participants in the event of a stage three emergency rotating outage. Please see the medical baseline information on the Edison website. Residents are also encouraged to enroll in Code Red v VMS co continually monitors information sources and communicates any potential danger to our residents via our Code Red emergency notification system. Code Red transmits brief, urgent messages to village residents as quickly as possible via text, phone, or email. To enroll in Code Red, visit lagunawoodsvillage.com and click on the black and red Code Red icon in the upper left-hand corner to fill out the form. Residents may also enroll after logging into the resident portal or request a hard copy form at the community center front desk. As you may have read in the recent What's Up in the Village, our maintenance and construction department is seeking volunteers. The Damage Restoration Division seeks a part-time resident volunteer to liaison with residents and assist the damage restoration staff and residents with coordinating appointments, monitoring work progress, facilitating the exchange of project information, and responding to resident inquiries. Similarly, the Manor Alterations Division is seeking part-time volunteer concierge to help by being the first point in, of contact for Manor Alterations after the kiosk check-in process to provide information and project status updates and direct customers to Manor Alterations or appropriate departments as necessary. Interested persons may find the descriptions and the application in What's Up in the Village and at lagunawoodsvillage.com under the news header. I'm also excited to announce that the Manor Alterations Office, located on the ground floor of the community center, will reopen on Tuesday, January 2nd, with three enhancements to better serve your needs. Use the drop-down menu at Resident Services 
to check in at the kiosk, visit resident Windows 7 and resident services for over-the-counter needs, and visit the new spacious and ergonomic manner alterations office intake counter, which features an accessible service station and a tabletop for plan layout. With the January 2nd reopening, business hours will return to Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. in manner alterations. I also want to touch on the Clubhouse One renovation project recently approved by the GRF board. Clubhouse One, constructed in 1964, is the most visited recreational village facility. Clubhouse One contains seven independent buildings, five of which are connected structurally under the same roof framing system. Multiple activity spaces are dated and in need of maintenance and modernized appearance, including the drop-in lounge, dining rooms and kitchens, the art room, billiards, game and multi-purpose rooms, main lounge, gym and fitness center, shuffleboard courts, archery range, and restrooms. The scope of the Clubhouse One renovation projects includes many facets, interior and exterior paint, replacing flooring, installing window treatments, replacing lighting with LED lighting, removing surface-mounted electrical and replacing it with code-compliant in-wall electrical systems, replacing the chandeliers and fireplace facade, replacing cabinets, appliances, and so forth in the kitchenettes, redoing the restrooms and pool locker rooms, replacing mirrors where appropriate, and replacing the windows and the doors to make the facility Title 24 compliant. In terms of the renovation schedule, Clubhouse One will be closed for six months, beginning in March 2024. The full access restriction is estimated to save $100,000 and limit exposures to issues such as risk navigating in a construction zone, exposure to construction noise and dust, constant accessibility changes to the facility, electrical and water disruptions, and limited parking while contractors are staging equipment and supplies. The Recreation and Special Events Department is taking all possible measures to relocate Clubhouse One events. Over the next several weeks, staff will adjust scheduling and contact all impacted users. The department requests your cooperation, please, while waiting to be contacted. The Village Library and Laguna Woods History Center will remain open with parking access behind the library building. And I want to conclude, please, by highlighting the exciting 2024 season planned at the Performing Arts Center, featuring the 2024 season headliner, Pat Boone, on October 19th, and a Neil Diamond tribute by Rob Garrett, a premier Neil Diamond tribute artist, on March 23rd. Tickets are available online and at the PAC box office. And that concludes my update this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Siobhan. Are there any questions from members of the board? Reza? Uh, uh, Siobhan, uh, there was a question about the, uh, the activity at Clubhouse One going to impact any of the Emeritus, Saddleback Emeritus classes, one. And second, what happens to the Emeritus classes, Clubhouse Four, if that's going to be impacted? Thank you. Thank you. That is all being considered, and again, as we finalize those plans, all potential users will be notified. Okay, so no decision has been made. We're working on all the details as we speak. But, but it does sound like everything in Clubhouse One, you know, the pool, the bocce courts, all that will be closed during the six months. It's just those two, uh, the, the library and the um, history center that are a little more street-facing that are going to be open. So just for clarification, Andy, you had a comment? Your question? Yeah, this, this is a general question. I don't know, Shaban, if you know it, but among the rooms listed in Clubhouse One is the art room. And I've used the art room as part of the string band where we had music rehearsal. I'm just wondering why it's called the art room. It seems to me to be a multi purpose room. I, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I will certainly endeavor to get that back to you. Okay, this I appreciate afternoon. that. Thank you. Rename it after renovation. Oh, perhaps. Oh, arts. <laughs> Music is arts. It could be, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe it was dedicated by art. Somebody. <laughs> call, it, call it the art room. All right. Okay, we're now moving on to agenda item 10, the consent uh, President calendar. Laws, I, I, uh, oh. Director Zellin has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Jules, my mistake. Um, Jules, you had a comment or question? I had a question for uh, Siobhan. 
is that a Pat Boone tribute? Or is Pat Boone, I mean, is he still alive? <laughs> it is Pat Boone. Yes, sir. Wow. Thank you. Uh, okay. I'm looking around. Thanks, Jules. Um, now now we'll, we'll move on to agenda item 10, which is our consent calendar. All matters listed under the consent calendar are recommended for action by committees and are suggested to be enacted by the board by a single motion. Today, per our consent calendar, the board is being asked to ratify the preliminary financials for the month of October 2023, approve four liens as recommended by the Finance Committee, uh, approve an alteration request for landscaping uh, recommended by the Landscape Committee, and uh, approve a variance request recommended by the Architectural Controls and Standards Committee, otherwise known as ACSC. Um, can I get a motion to approve today's consent calendar? Okay, SK moves, Jim seconds. Thank you both. Any questions or comments regarding the consent calendar from board members? Okay. So seeing, so he looked over. Oh, okay. Had a member okay. Seeing none, uh, we'll consider the consent calendar approved by consent. And we'll move on to agenda item 11. Um, agenda item 11, we will be discussing unfinished business. Agenda item 11A is for the board to entertain a motion to approve the proposed updates to architectural standard 18 for gutters and downspouts. These updates were recommended by the ACSC. Last month, the board voted to put these updates forward for 28-day member review and comment. So today we will be voting as to whether or not to implement these changes going forward. Um, first, Chris, can you please read the uh, resolution for us? Yes. Standard 18, gutters and downspouts. Whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend standards and create new standards as necessary, and whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to revise Standard 18, gutters and downspouts. Now, therefore, be it resolved December 19, 2023, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts Standard 18, gutters and downspouts, as attached to the official minute, meeting minutes, and resolve further that Resolution 03-18-91, adopted June 19, 2018, is hereby superseded in its entirety and no longer in effect, and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written. Thank you, Chris. Um, can I get a motion to approve the updates to Standard 18 before we discuss further? Jim moves, Brad seconds. Thank you both. Any questions, comments from members of the board? Okay, so none. All right. Um, Paul, any comments from anyone? Any members? All right. Okay, great. Then now it's time to vote. Again, we'll be voting to confirm these changes to our gutters and downspouts standard and have them implemented by our manor alteration staff going forward. Director Allen, can I have your vote, please? Uh, yes, that's my raised hand. Thank, Thank you. you. And Director Engel, we have a yes as well. Okay. Okay. All right. Motion passes, 10 to zero. Yeah, so this, but, okay, got it. So this motion passes, I'll, I'll say that a little louder. Uh, 10, four, zero against, zero abstentions. So thank you, board. Moving on to agenda item 11B. It's for the board to entertain a motion to approve the proposed updates to architectural standard 11 for exterior floor coverings. These updates were recommended also by the ACSC. And last month, the board also voted to put the standard forward for 28-day member review and comment. So today, we'll be voting as to whether or not to implement this updated standard um, uh, going forward. And before we proceed, again, request that Chris read the resolution for us. Standard 11, exclusive use, common area, floor coverings. Whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to amend standards and create new standards as necessary, and whereas the Architectural Control and Standards Committee recognizes the need to revise Standard 11, Exclusive Use, Common Area Floor Coverings. 
Now, therefore, be it resolved December 19, 2023, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts Standard 11, Exclusive Use Common Area Floor Coverings, as attached to the official meeting minutes, and resolve further that Resolution 03-18-41, adopted March 23, 2018, is hereby superseded in its entirety and no longer in effect, and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this written re this resolution as written. Great. Thanks, Chris. All right, can I now get a motion to approve the update of Standard 11 before we discuss it further? Jim moves, Chris seconds, thank you. Uh, any questions or comments from members of the board? Bart, can you come up? I have a question for you. And my question specifically is about the wording of, of uh, 2.5. It's one that we kind of talked about last time, and I think you tweaked it a little bit for me, but I'm not sure if, if the punctuation is correct. It reads, a four inch most strip will be left set back on all patio slab coverings, period. Unless one is already present, semicolon. For all walkway coverings, a four inch most strip will be installed along the entire alteration. So I, um, I think, you know, last time I brought up um, that I already had a most strip of six inches between my lawn and my patio cover, and I was wondering if I were to cover that patio, excuse me, my patio, and if I were to cover that patio, say, with tile, would I have to leave a four-inch um, gap or mow strip, even though I already have a six-inch mow strip between my lawn and the patio? And I, that, that, So that was my question, and so I wasn't sure if this period is in the wrong place, if it's supposed to say a four-inch most strip will be left on all patio slab coverings unless one is already present, um, so I'm kind of confused. Can you clarify that for me? And I, I think you are correct. That period should not be there. That should be a comma instead of it, so we will make the final revision before printing. Okay, okay. I, I just wanted to make sure that um, if I did something, I wasn't going to... Uh, break any rules by trying to cover my patio uh, with tile. If there's the already one the existing, there's no need to put a new one. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. That's all I had. Any other questions, comments? All right. Um, and Paul, any comments from any members today? All right. Okay. So again, now it's time for us to vote on this, whether we want to confirm these changes with, again, Bart will make this minor little punctuation change before it's uh, finalized, but uh, with that change. Okay, and so this uh, motion also passes. Ten yeses, zero noes, zero abstentions, so thank you. Um, and I think, Bart, hey Bart, you may be done for now. <laughs> thank you. Moving on to agenda item 11C which is for the board to entertain a motion to approve the proposed updates to our fruit tree policy. These updates were recommended by the Landscape Committee. As you may recall, in an effort to reduce the rodent problem within the village and our mutual, uh, a prior board had installed a policy to have all fruit trees automatically removed at the time of the sale of a manor. This change that we're going to be discussing today will allow the buyer of a manor that has fruit trees to keep them if they agree to maintain them rather than have them automatically um, removed. Uh, so last month the board voted to put this uh, proposed update uh, forward for 28 day member review and approval or comment, excuse me. So today we'll be voting as to whether or not to adopt the proposed updates and uh, start following them going forward. And uh, with all of us, with all of these, Chris, could you read the resolution for us? Oh, it's a long one, isn't it? Yes, um, before I read it, just to let you know, there's a Scribner error in the paragraph that uh, begins, now therefore be resolved. Uh, the reference to the board of directors uh, is made twice. Okay. Okay. Um, fruit tree and vegetable policy. Whereas fruit trees in the common area were planted by or at the request of members as a part of the discontinued Yellow State program. And whereas fruit trees are not maintained or trimmed by the mutual and are the responsibility of the member to maintain. 
And whereas fruit trees and vegetable gardens are a known attractant and food source for wildlife and rodents, and unmaintained fruit trees exacerbate the problem, and whereas two garden centers have been provided by the Golden Rain Foundation for the purpose of providing a place for residents to grow tomatoes or fruit crop, food crops, and whereas there has been a significant decrease in rodent activity since Resolution 03-19-94 was put into effect. Now, therefore, be it resolved December 19, 2023, that the Board of Directors of this corporation introduces the revised fruit tree and vegetable policy, which prohibits the planting of any fruit trees in common area and requires members to maintain existing fruit trees on common area and in exclusive use common area. Resolve further, the planting of vegetables and new fruit trees in common area is prohibited and resolve further existing fruit trees in common area in exclusive use are to be maintained by the member, and resolve further during the resale process, the responsibility to maintain existing fruit trees in common area may be accepted by the new member if the new member de declines to accept the responsibility to maintain the fruit trees, the fruit trees will be removed at no cost to the members and resolve further to maintain the health and safety of the members. Fruit trees found to be unmaintained will be removed after notice by the mutual at no cost to the member. And resolve further resolution 03-19-94 effective January 1, 2020, is hereby superseded in its entirety and no, in no longer in effect. Resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. Okay, okay thank you very much. All right, can I get a motion to approve the updated fruit tree policy before we discuss it further? SK moves, Moon seconds. Thank you both. Any questions, comments from members of the board? So we'll start with Reza and then Andy. Uh, I have two questions. One is, who owns the fruit and the fruit tree when it's common area? The members take care of the tree, but there are other members that are passing by in the common area and pick the fruit. Is that fruit belong to the member that take care of the tree? Or because it has been in the past some source of commotion. <laughs> so what is the, who owns the, the fruits? The person that take care of the tree or its common area? I don't know that there's an official answer to that question. I'm, I'm going to start with Siobhan and see if she has any thoughts. Um, That's a great question. I, I don't have an answer, and I was yeah, going to look I mean, and see if Kurt might yeah. have I mean, one. I, I would hope that, that the people that are walking by and thinking that they can pick it might ask before they do, but um, I don't know. So that, if that's something that um, you think yeah, the board the needs to discuss, then we can add that to a future agenda item. Yeah, but by, but by, but by regulation, if you take care of something, you you know you, you, the fruit of the tree is yours. Yeah. But you know it's in common area, and when it comes to that commotion between the two members, somebody picked the tree. I saw signs that goes on trees that said, "Don't touch, don't pick." <laughs> so maybe maybe Kurt maybe Kurt has a, a some, solution. Some thought or we, thoughts. We actually did get legal counsel's opinion on this back in 2019, and the the fruit does belong to everybody. Okay. Because it is in common area. People are being permitted to put trees in common area, but it's still common area. Okay. Okay. Then uh, that, that content goes to the exclusive area. We say that in the common area, if the resale, you have to get rid of the trees if the member doesn't want it. What about the, it, that it's pretty silence on the exclusive area, the fruit tree in the exclusive area. I don't understand the question. Well, the exclusive says, area would be, yeah. would be just like in the regular world. If your fruit hangs over your fence, then it's open to the public. If it doesn't hang over the fence, <laughs> no, so no, 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 In the exclusive area, the it would belong to the member. No, I'm not talking about the fruit. I'm talking about the tree at the resale. In the exclusive area, automatically the tree going to be removed or... That's separate from the common area truth fruit. So the, this new resolution takes away the automatic removal of trees at resale, period. We're no longer removing them at resale unless the new buyer does not want to maintain them. 
and then we will remove them. If the new buyer wants to maintain them, the ones in common area, they can now stay. The ones in exclusive use area are yeah, just like anything else in exclusive use. It belongs to the owner, it belongs to the new owner, and they can do whatever they want with it. Okay. This, this just states that they have to maintain it. So, for so we're mainly control. talking about the common areas, yeah. not the exclusive areas. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Beep, beep. Just, just a second, Andy, and then we'll go to this side. <laughs> I think he was voting. I think he may have been voting, but we'll get to Oh, George. I know. I have oh, a comment. Okay. <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Andy. Okay, as I walk around, I, I see things, and I've seen fruit trees on uh, right next to a manor. And then I've looked and I've seen fruit on the ground, lots of fruit. And I'm thinking, I'm told rodents eat this stuff. True. And that would violate the standard of care, wouldn't it, if fruit... But, you know, stuff happens. People are away and... Yes. And this is the... right. I'm told December and January are the ripening times for many citrus plants. That's correct. So the trees are loaded with fruit and they're ripening and in the normal course of events, if you don't pick a ripe fruit, it drops to the ground. That's nature's way of doing it. Um, what happens when a, somebody we, that's my you staff think is does, taking does care best, of it isn't? My staff does their best to notify the resident that their tree needs to be maintained. We do, in, our, in a different tree policy, we have requirements on what, we define what maintaining a fruit tree is, and that is actually one of them. So we endeavor to let the resident know that they need to maintain it, and if they don't, then we give them notice that we'll recant. We'll yeah, I'll just it. tell you, it's, it's a sign to me. If I see fruit on the ground, it says, pick me. But there's <laughs> well, really, I mean, but waste the not want that, you know? <laughs> okay, second question, final question. In my walks, I've seen at least one instance of fruit tree not next to the manor, but across the sidewalk along a slope. Are there supposed to be any wild fruit trees growing? No, often They're not contiguous <laughs> to a manor. With the exception of fig trees on slopes, uh, most of those were planted by residents um, over the years. So the, the original, this original policy was to try to get rid of all those, uh, but now if the resident wants to maintain them, if they're in the back of the manor, it's semi theirs. If they want to take ownership of it and maintain it, it can stay. If they don't want to take ownership of it, then we will remove it. Well, in this case, I'm talking about and one particular fruit tree, the tangerine tree, which incidentally was sour. Uh, it's about 10 feet off the walk towards the slope, right on the edge of the slope. So there's no manor, literally, right there. So you're saying somebody could step up and say, I want to take care of that tree? Generally, we go to the manor closest to it, because that's generally who. Back in the old days of the, gold, of the Yellow State program, people got a little carried away with where they were planting things, which okay. is one of the reasons why we did away with the Yellow State program. So like a lot of those were planted by residents in the area with the intent of taking care of them. Okay, so in the normal inspections of the crew, and there's a, in this particular case, there's a fence wooden fence along the slope at the top. It gets looked at from time to time, I'm sure. Somebody's looking at the fence. Would they notice the fruit tree? The person looking at the fence? I don't. I, they wouldn't care about the fruit tree. <laughs> uh, okay. I think they're, fo I think they're fence focused. So, All right, well, so, so, so Andy, I, I would like to suggest you um, maybe get it's a better location. I'm, I'm, oh, I have I'm, a specific I'm location. From, I'm hearing from Kurt that Chances are, if it's there, then staff has already found an owner for it. Um, but, but if you can get the specifics to him, okay. he'll confirm that for us. That's what I'm pointing out. There's some rogue trees that are away from the manors that you wouldn't think anybody had response. But maybe they do, and that's fine. It's just, yeah. you know, just looking for that. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Moon? And then, and then SK? Yeah. Okay. I like the Curtis answer. The trees is all in common area, so it belongs to everybody. We are assigning who's taking care of it. That this resolution, the tree is belong to everybody. Okay, whoever taking care of has a priority because he's taking care of, okay, whatever product or whatever, but it belongs to everybody. Okay, 
In Korea, I'm Korean. In Korea, there's a famous saying, as Jim said, that to fruit coming over the fence, so the other people over the fence are taking it. So the guy who went to that house and sticking his hand over the, the door, whose hand is this? Oh, that's your hand. So the trees over the fence is my hand, mine, not belong to you. So I like that. <clears throat> Fat needle. So, but think about it. United does not have this policy at all. Okay, only third mutual about three, four, five years ago had that because of rodent problem. But I'm so glad belated about we are setting up this and there's a lot of people love to take care of, take care of tree. They don't care about, they do care sometimes, but they don't care about the fruit and byproduct. So I like this and I'm voting for. Thank you. Thanks, Moon. SK? Yeah, the question is, then, if I need a lemon, I can go out there and pick one from any tree? May, may I rephrase? Uh, the law says that the tree belongs to everybody. Mm -hmm. Common courtesy says you ask the person who the lives there for it. Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 But thank you. Thanks. And Jules, did you have a question or, or a comment, or were you voting? Uh, no, just... Just a comment, uh, Kurt said it absolutely right. Common courtesy, as Mark had indicated, would suggest that the person who is maintaining it has some moral claim to it, but it's simply a moral claim. The ground belongs to us. The tree is connected to the ground, belongs to the ground. The, tr the, 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 the fruit belongs to the tree. It's like the law of fixtures. If someone affixes something to real property, it becomes part of the real property. And the, and the lemons, no matter who has a moral claim, belong to everybody. Okay. Yeah. Hey, thank you, Jules. I rest my case. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Jules. Any yeah. other questions, comments? Uh, Reza, you have more. Just one comment about the pomegranates and around the uh, golf course. Please don't touch them. <laughs> don't apply this to them. They are, they are pretty and uh, they, they, they will look beautiful. I hope it doesn't apply to the pomegranate trees. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. And Paul, do we have any member comments? Yes. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jim Southworth. This policy, thank you. This policy looks pretty good to me. Uh, it does provide for the exclusive use by whoever maintains the tree. Thus, I believe that legal opinion was wrong or it answered the wrong question and should be looked at again because by this policy, you're establishing my exclusive use of a tree. Now, here's my situation. When I moved when I bought my unit several years ago, I assumed responsibility and I guess therefore ownership of two dwarf lemons. I assumed the responsibility on behalf of the residents of the 24 units in our building. Now, last year, in one day, someone came into our our exclusive use area, which I had maintained is the area by the building, and stripped our trees bare. In the past, people from outside our building, outside our 24 to 48 residents, have stripped and stolen our fruit. This gives us the exclusive right for the exclusive uses, exclusive right to me. I would suggest that that legal opinion be reviewed because this seems to imply an exclusive use. Uh, also, there should be provisions or sanctions for people stealing the work of other people, the watering, fertilizing, the pruning, the care, keeping, picking up and removing the uh, dropped fruit, 
doesn't happen much in our trees. So my suggestion is that this does provide exclusive use. And I would report anyone taking our fruit from our tree, our building's tree that I now assume I own, uh, to the sheriff. I'm not going to deal with security. Um, but you might consider a provision of a sanction of some sort for someone who takes fruit without provision or without, without permission. That's it. But we need to respect, <laughs> respect that use by the residents of our build, in particular, our three stories. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next speaker is Ms. Cheryl Finnick. I truly wasn't going to speak today. I, I truly was. I was just going to, but I couldn't help myself. Uh, this is a result of a refrigerated door winning, by the way. So um, anyway, um, I uh, have, when I moved in, the, the owner before, um, uh, you, you have to decide whether you're going to keep the gardens around. If not, they have to remove and you pay for it. So I chose to keep it. And one of the things was a pot that had an orange tree in it. It wasn't in the ground. It was in a pot. And... Um, I would try to take care of it, and it didn't, fruit, it didn't have any fruit for a couple of years, and I worked so hard on it. I had two stinking oranges. <laughs> I finally was going to pick, and some son of a gun came and picked it. So, yeah, I'm not a happy camper, what you're saying. Um, and I, I don't know if it's still true, but a bunch of years I researched this, and I don't know if it's still on the books, but in the state of California, um, when you steal citrus fruit, it's a felony. Of course, that's going to be 5,000 pounds of it, but it's still a felony. Those are big oranges. And um, I can't tell you how angry I was. I, I don't remember exactly the sign I put up by my orange tree, but it wasn't very nice. Actually, people put it on Facebook because it was just too funny for them. Anyway, the point is, is that, so I have, my, my plant is in a pot. Does that, it's not in the ground. What about that? Thanks. Thank you. All right, okay, Moon, you have further comment? Common area is a common area. Okay. Uh, let me say straightly, common area is not belong to individual manner or individual owner. Common area belongs to third mutual. So even if you take care of it, all that, I was just mentioning earlier, we are giving privilege to take care of the trees and enjoy the trees growing, all that. But we are not giving away our common area's right to individual manner. So you can share with them. I know some people are very upset because they've been taken care of for all this time. And then one day, all fruit gone. Those are extreme, but still, I think a common area belong to to the mutual. Thank you. Thank you, move. Yes, Reza. Uh, I think the definition of common area and exclusive area is a little bit uh, skewed here. Uh, the common area is the members don't have a right to it. The exclusive area are boundaries and their gates. They're, you know, they're areas that only used by the member, by the owner of that unit. Uh, the example of the pot, if you put your plan in a pot and put it in your patio, which is your exclusive use area, nobody should come in that area. That's your area. Nobody can come there. And, but if you take that pot and put it in the middle of the common area, that's common area. Everyone passes by, and they might pick up your fruit. So we need to make sure. But the other issue that came up, which kind of brought it as legal issue, is saying that exclusive use of a tree, that's totally different from common area versus exclusive area. That means if I go and plant a tree in, uh, you know, next to the golf course, 
that's my tree, and I take care of it, and I own it, and nobody can touch it. I don't think, according to the California law, that's applicable. So as long as in your, in your exclusive use area, then you have every right. But if you are in the common area, that's common. That means you share with everyone else. I think we need to make sure that we understand the difference between common and exclusive use area. That's my comment about that. Thank you. Thank you. All right. One, one last time. Any other comments? Hey, Jules, did you have something more to say? Or, or were you, you're, I see your hand up, Jules. Is, did you have a comment or question? Or is it left up from last time? You voting? Okay, maybe Jules has stepped away for a second. Um, and so, all right. I, it's, I'm going to say it's time, time for us to vote. His hand, his hand went down. Time for us to vote. Again, we're voting whether to confirm the changes, as uh, Chris mentioned, and, and uh, have our landscaping team follow them going forward. Okay. All right. So the voting is done. This one also passed 10 yeses, zero no's, uh, zero abstentions. Um, I'm happy to. Uh, chat with the board and see if we want a, another legal opinion. Uh, if we think that needs to be revisited or clarified in any way, we can chat about that and make that decision. Going forward. Yeah. Thank you, board. Moving on to uh, agenda item 12, which is new business. Um, all right. First new business item is agenda item 12A for the board to entertain a motion to approve a new barbecue policy. These updates were recommended by the Resident Policy and Compliance Committee, and today we'll be voting as to whether or not to submit these updates forward for 28-day member review and comment. As you may recall, our previous barbecue policy was rescinded by this board back in September, um, so now there are no barbecue policies at all. And it's kind of a free-for-all potentially. Um, uh, but at the same time that the board rescinded that, they did uh, request that the Resident Policy Compliance Committee come up with some new policies. Specifically, um, the main discussion topic was not allowing charcoal in multi-story buildings. So um, that's kind of how we got here. Um, yeah. Can I get a motion to place this barbecue policy on 28-day member review and comment before we talk about it any further? Brad moves, Jim seconds. Thank you. Any questions, comments on this from the board before we go to potential member comments? Yes, Moon. Thank you. Until we set a new barbecue policy, we are not rescinding it completely so everybody can do barbecue whatever without any regulation whatsoever. I'd rather have to previous uh, policy on in effect until we have new complete policy set. That is my comment and uh, if I need to make a motion, I would like to make a motion to that effect. Okay, all right. So. Um yeah, so the, the current policy is gone. So that was agreed by this board um, uh, uh, in September of this year. So there is nothing. So that, that's why we're trying to put a, a new one in place as soon as we can, essentially. Yes? So it takes time to set up the new policy. Meanwhile, there, there's a dangerous period in a way or, you know, nobody taking looking at you know it's a free hand mm -hmm. but I rather have that period of time I want to have a previous policy in effect I mean we, we hear you we hear you um, as would I have but uh, we were voted down in September so um, um, so the, the so, all right. so we now have to live that it's been a free-for-all for two months so far uh, hopefully if we can get this the policy uh, approved for 28 day member notice uh, it'll only be one more month any other questions, comments from board members? I have. Okay, yes, Ralph. Uh, I have trouble understanding everything you have under conditions in Parrot Roman numeral three. 
uh, it looks to me, in A, you say propane wood pellet and electric grills are permitted in multi- and single-story buildings. Do we have anything besides multi- and single-story? I'm, I'm sorry, your question was, is there a difference between, uh, you know, I mean, I mean well, multi- and single-story buildings should cover everything. You're saying propane, wood pellet, and electric grills are permitted in multi- and single-story buildings, and then C, you say... Uh, You've eliminated charcoal grills, or you put in the charcoal grills. I guess you mean that charcoal grills are not permitted in single-story buildings, or I, I don't understand all this. Oh, okay. No, so it's charcoal bills. Sorry, charcoal, charcoal grills are permitted only in single-story buildings. They are not per, not permitted in multi-story buildings with with this. Let's change that to say permitted only rather than only permitted. Okay, I can live with that. That's, that's one thing. Uh, I'm questioning why uh, why uh, wood pellets are permitted, but but uh, charcoal is not. But what's the philosophy behind this? The specific type. Yeah. So. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, if you look at under definition 2A4, it kind of defines what an electric uh, wood pellet grill is. I, I, know, I understand that definition. Why, why are you permitting uh, wood pellets but not uh, uh, charcoal on third-story buildings? Um, because, yeah, um, charcoal is open flame, electric wooden pellets don't tend to be open flame? They are open flame, because they're just that the pellets are fed in as, as they are needed by the electronic device. Oh, okay. I, I had one once, and I put it together, and I sent it back. I didn't want to keep it, but uh, I know how they operate. Uh, you, have a, you have a reservoir of wood pellets, and they are fed automatically in response to a thermostat. Uh, so other than that, you are burning wood in both cases. With wood pellets, uh, most of your uh, charcoal is really a wood pellet. Is there a significant difference there? I, do, I fail to see it. Um, I think the wood pellets are just a flavor enhancer, where the charcoal is actually more of an open flame. Yeah, open flame. I think part of the issue is is how they are cooled. Um, you know, wood pellets tend to be cooled in the in the box, the the grill that they're in, where charcoal might be tossed out as a trash chute. Um, um, but but from an odor, there may not be much difference if that's what you're suggesting. So. Um, I'm wondering what the intent is. If you're if you're uh, trying to restrict from somebody from throwing something down the trash chute, that that's one thing. Uh, if that's the case, why not say it? Um, so, I, I, I'm. I, if you have suggested changes to the wording, um, uh, Ralph, I'd suggest you provide it. Um, if you don't like the way this is worded and have no suggestions, I'd. Suggest you vote no. Um, pellet grills are often electric, um, and you know we we you know electric doesn't necessarily aren't always wood pellet. However, and so we try to uh, differentiate electric, which might have a burner, uh, a a, a um, kind of like in your oven versus a wood pellet grill, but they tend to be electric. So we were just trying to define that a little bit better, but it sounds like that confused you more than not. So we'll take a look at it, but. Mark, basically the way those work is that they are electronically controlled by measuring the heat and the heat, like any thermostat, will control the amount of pro uh, fuel that goes into the burner box. And you're gonna, you're gonna have, uh, in one case, you're not controlling it with electrical control. Electrical, you're controlling it supposedly, as long as everything works right. But uh, but that's that's all you're doing. You're not really burning anything different. Um, okay. And, and that to me, I don't see the difference is being significant there. Uh, the the other question I have is is uh, propane tanks shall not exceed 20 pounds. Uh, I assume what you're saying is a 20, a nominal 20 pounds. 
when you buy a 20-pound tank full of propane from, from uh, uh, Home Depot, what you get is a net weight of 15 pounds of propane. And I think you should, if that's what you mean, then you ought to state that. Like a state it in net weight of propane or state it in, uh, if, if you've got to use the 20, or you need to put in a nominal 20 pounds. Okay. The, tank, the tanks are rated, the tanks, tanks are rated by water capacity. That's the confusing part. It, it, yes, if you went online and, and looked up, you know, the uh, standard tank, it, it would come back with 20 pounds. So that was kind of why we use that wording. But um, I'll, I'll work with you and we'll see if we can come yeah, up with some. I don't want somebody to go looking to put a 20 pound tank in there, a pound of 20 pounds of propane. That, that's like, that's big enough to put a bomb on your porch. If you, if you rake, rapture a whole rupture a hose in one of those, that's going to burn a long time. Uh, they do have smaller tanks. They have uh, they have one pound tanks. Uh, and, and as far as an apartment building, my question is ultimately: Does this conform to the state requirements? State requirement used to pre prevent an open flame, like a propane tank, used to used to prevent that uh, on a multi-story building. Furthermore, you are not allowed to carry more than a one pound tank in the elevator getting up to the third floor or something like that. Now, maybe that's been removed. I just wonder if this conforms to all the state requirements. Okay, yeah, I believe we've looked through that and uh, do, but we'll look again. Okay, because I, I ran into that, you know, two years ago when I worked on this thing, so I was a little cautious of it. Uh, but those are, those are the things that I concern, I'm concerned with here mostly. We did okay. not consider the wood pellet uh, electronically controlled uh, unit at that time, but uh, so that's a new item here, which you're defining. But I, I just think 20 pounds of propane on the second floor of a three-story building, I think, is asking for trouble. But uh, if, if that's permitted by state code now, okay, there's a change I wasn't aware of. Okay, thank you, Reza. Uh, it's pretty. Uh, this uh, it's pretty silence and the smokers. Is the smoker classified differently, or is part of this thing? Because a lot of these barbecue grill right now is that dual sm smoker and grill, and some of them just smokers. And there is no reference to any smokers. There is is right. that covered under different policy? No, I think it's... So smokers is here? Sure. So, so we can is it allowed or is it not allowed? It's allowed. Allowed? Mm -hmm. Well, okay. Mm -hmm. But, but, well, that, but then if, that didn't tell me that, that you know I can use smokers under this yeah. policy. Okay, sounds fine. Good. We'll, we'll, as yeah. a, as a no, uh, that's a different policy device, or as a or not propane, but as a uh, charcoal device, or as a wood pellet device. Okay, we will we'll clarify that. I think that needs to be. All right. All right. That's all. Okay. Thanks, Rob. Your hand is still up, so you're, you're done, or do you still have more? We get it down here. Thank okay, you. fair enough. <laughs> just curious, just make sure. Make sure. There's okay. buttons on here. I'm not used to all those buttons. That... No, right. Anyway. Okay. Um, any other question, comment from board members before I ask if there's any from people in the audience? Okay, right, Paul, we have any members? <clears throat> yes, uh, Mr. Jim Southworth. Okay. again. Uh, thank you for bringing forth this resolution. I've listened to some of the concerns here. Um, I'm not going to deal with the smoker issue, although that, I believe, fall under electric grill because it uses a pan for chips to sit on, a small amount of chips to sit on uh, an electric uh, heating griddle to make them smoke. Uh, regarding the electric Definition A4, the electric wood pellet drill, that word typically might be struck so that it would read electric wood pellet grill is electronically controlled. It's not an open flame. It is an open flame in that there is a small box. The failure of a thermostat will result in it in pellets not being fed from a separate container into the uh, uh, pellet firebox 
chamber. Also, it would stop the fans. So you're, you're, it's, it, it's just incomparable to charcoal. And I say that from the experience I've had with two separate instances of my brother-in-law having had one for years, and, and by no, there is no coincidence, my son has had one for a couple years. I don't intend to ever get one, but someone might. And I've experienced how they use them and work with them and using them. Uh, they're pretty innocuous as far as any sort of fire risk. Um, 3B, the conditions. Um, not exceed 20 pounds, that might be a 20 pound standard tank or a standard because that's what you see when you go on Amazon or you go to Home Depot or Lowe's or whatever XYZ um, store to find a tank. And that's just a standard. That's all you can buy, practically speaking. So anyway, thank you for the work you've done on this and uh, appreciate the opportunity to comment. Thank you, Mr. Southworth. All right. Any other member comments? Moon? Yeah, I was the one who rescinded this policy because I, you know, summertime you have a neighbor coming and friend coming and have some barbecue and maybe beer or wine. It's such beautiful. I want that enjoyment to, to everybody. But it appears <clears throat> We have so many different buildings, so many different uh, the area. We have a garden villa building, and we have a one-story building. We have a two-story building. They are all different. So it appears to me one size, it's not going to be one size fits all. We may have to have a different location, different rules, different ways. Although it's very cumbersome, a lot of trouble. So we may have to look into different. So the issue here is basically fire and smoke because of smell and then people gathering together, there will be noise. So how are we going to prevent, how are we going to control those uh, in different locations, different place? We have to set it up different. Too. We may have to set up three, four different rules. And then on top of that, Every year, every time, the technology different, improve. So we cannot chase them all. So we have to have some kind of global rule and then DB up the three, four different locations, how we set it up. Thank you. Thank you. All right, any other comments? All right. So there's a, a motion to accept this. Um, policy with the comments made and, and put it on 28-day member review and comment. We've heard some of those comments here today. Um, um, and so the intent would be to, to tweak this a little bit based upon the comments we received um, and uh, vote on it again in 28 days if we vote yes. So that's kind of what we're being asked to do. And I think it's now time to vote yes or no whether we want to um, put this on 28-day member review and comment or um, if we choose to vote no, uh, we can kick it back to the Resident Policy and Compliance Committee as appropriate. And so it's time to vote. I think we're having uh, audio issues with Jules. Jules, can you speak up again? Uh, yeah, can you hear me this time? Yes. <clears throat> there you go. Okay, I abstain. Okay. <laughs> okay, so Rob is a negative. Is that correct? Sorry. Okay. All right. Ralph, Ralph says is, is, is Ralph, are you voting yes or no? Just tell us. No. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I, I clicked on the wrong button. My mistake. Yeah, I'll fix it. Okay. Or I voted no. Yeah. Right. Right. So it looks like seven of us voted yes. Just to um, uh, tweak this a bit and bring it back for next time. Um, you get more comments, perhaps. Um, two voted no and one abstention. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving on to agenda item 12B, which is for this board to entertain a motion to approve the proposed updates to thirds purchasing policy. 
These updates were recommended by the Finance Committee, and today we'll, we will be voting as to whether or not to accept the changes and have our purchasing team follow this policy for third going forward. Now, does anyone from staff have any opening comments they want to share with us regarding this uh, before we? Uh, thank you, and thank you for your consideration. The purchasing policy, hopefully as most of you know, the, the task force themselves had met throughout 2023. So it was brought forward uh, before all three boards. There was actually additions that were asked to be made to the third policy specifically. So they are all captured here within this uh, version of the policy, and we're looking forward to your review. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, before we get too much further, I'll let uh, Chris read the resolution for us, please. Revised purchasing policy, whereas the purchasing task force is aimed to establish robust purchasing controls to optimize the internal pr procurement and contracting procedures. The primary objective is to enhance transparency and to institute a professional competitive approach to the acquisition of products and services. And whereas a task force met numerous times during 2023 to, number one, incorporate revisions necessary for the upcoming ERP or Enterprise Resources Planning implementation. Number two, clarify items identified by members of the task force. And three, review authority limits. And now, therefore, be it resolved December 19, 2023, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby approves the purchasing policy, purchasing matrix, change order policy, sole source form, and single source form as presented, and resolve further that resolution 03-16-100 adopted September 20, 2016 is hereby superseded and canceled. Resolve further <laughs> that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out the purpose of this resolution as written. Great, thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, can I get a motion to approve the purchasing policy changes before we discuss them further? Andy moves, SK seconds. Thank you both. Any questions, comments from members of the board? Okay. All right. Um, any questions, comments from any other members? All right. Okay. Um, I, I think the document could be written a little bit better. I think there's some things that aren't as clear as I'd like them to be. Um, a non substantial financial interest, uh, a nominal value. I'm not sure what those things mean. So I'll vote no, but that's, those are minor things, I think. Um, so given that, it's now time for us to vote. Thank you. Uh, Jules, can I have your vote, please? I abstain. Thank you. All right, and this um, also passes seven yeses, two noes, and one abstention. Thank you, board, and thank you, Steve. All right, moving on to agenda item 12C, it's for the board to approve updated committee assignments. Uh, these assignments have been made mainly as a result of the recent selection of Reza to our board and uh, 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 giving him some assignments, and fitting him in where appropriate, where we could. Um, so can I get a motion to approve the updated committee assignments before we discuss them further? Uh, Chris moves, uh, SK seconds, thanks. Any questions, comments, members of the board about these committee assignments? Yes, Moon? <laughs> I'm interested in the GRF Community Activity Committee if you don't have any objections. Uh, um, yeah, there's, there's only two openings for GRF committees for us, and, and right now those are filled. Yeah. 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 Thanks. Yeah, I know there, uh, you know, I understand that there's some committees, I know even Reza would like to be on some committees that he might not be on, uh, but they're kind of full and will rotate as time goes on. And as once, you know, if, if anybody is on a committee that you don't want to be on, let me know. and. Uh, um, we can then uh, uh, make those adjustments. Yes, Reza? Yeah, that, I thought probably as alternate on broadband and information technology, if you want to put me as alternate, 
because I've been involved with it and uh, I might be able to help if uh, somebody is not available. Okay. Okay. So you've been involved in information technology? Cause yeah, I, broadband and... Because I attend all those and I haven't heard of you in those meetings? No, I, uh, broadband. Uh, <coughs> broadband, <coughs> broadband, I yeah. understand. Uh, but I said information technology, I was alternate also. But oh, that, okay. Okay. So if, if it's okay, I'll, I'll be okay. alternate. If not, that's okay. fine with me. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um. Okay. All right. Well, um, appreciate that. I'll leave it as is for the moment. No. And uh, I guess it's time for us to vote. So we're essentially voting on these as is. Um, in our plan. And Jules, can I have your vote, please? I vote no. Thank you. Okay. So this uh, passes eight, one, eight yes, one no, one abstention. Okay. Okay. Just make sure I see who. Okay, we're going to skip item. 12D for the moment, um, since that's scheduled uh, for 11.30. And we will move on to agenda item 13 and uh, share our monthly committee status updates for our third board committees. And then we'll start with the finance committee. Andy, floor is yours. Thank you. The third finance committee uh, met on Tuesday, December 5th, and we covered uh, our performance year to date. We're in pretty good shape overall on our operating uh, budget. The favorable variance we have will be reduced somewhat for year end accruals and catch ups. Our investment policy is doing very well. In fact, the rates have remained higher than we expected and will continue to optimize our income versus our exposure. At some point, if and when the Fed drops rates, we'll reevaluate our position. The next meeting of the Finance Committee is slated for Tuesday, February 6th. 2024 at 1.30 p.m. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Next, we have the ACSC. Jim? Yeah, the ACSC committee met on December 11th, 2023. Uh, the only item that we had was the over-the-counter variance that was approved today in item 10D. Other than that, everything's moving smoothly. Everything's getting done in a timely manner, and that's why we don't have that much business because we've caught up on everything. Our next meeting will be January 8th, 2024, at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom and as a virtual meeting. Great. Thank you. Um, what's new regarding the third maintenance and construction committee, Ralph? Uh, not a whole lot. There's uh, Our last meeting was uh, back in November because of different holidays. We kind of got a schedule screwed up, but our next meeting is January 8th uh, next year. Okay. That's Great. That's all I'm Okay. Thanks, Ralph. Um, uh, anything you want to share with us regarding the Landscape Committee, Brad? <clears throat> sure. We're uh, working with Kurt, um, and actually, I was also going to reach out to United. We're looking at some different ways to increase service levels, especially in the number of times we do maintenance on uh, shrubs, trees, um, and looking at offings, offsetting that with possibly outsourcing some different um, less expensive or less skilled uh, type of service. But that's all kind of in flux right now. But we are looking at it, and we're coming up with some, um, what I would consider some pretty interesting ways of looking at things, and Kurt's been really excellent to work with on that. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Um, Jules, is there anything about the Water Conservation Committee you'd like to share? Only that we will eventually have a meeting next month. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I think it is scheduled for next month sometime. The All 24th. right. Okay. Thank you. January 24th. All right. 
And next we have the third resident policy and compliance committee. This committee last met on Wednesday, November 29th, um, and during that meeting we discussed the new barbecue policy that the board voted on earlier today. We also discussed third's compliance notices in an effort to make them clear, specifically with regards to when and by whom the evidence of any potential violation was witnessed. This uh, committee, excuse me, will next meet on Tuesday, January 23rd at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. We plan to continue our discussion regarding the various notices sent out by our compliance team. Um, we plan to review our current caregiver temporary storage pod and RV parking policies as well to see if any changes to them are appropriate. And uh, that's all we have for third mutual committees. We'll now move on to agenda item 14, where we'll share our monthly GRF committee status updates, starting with the GRF Community Activities Committee. Um, this committee last met on Thursday, December 14th, so last Thursday. During that meeting, the committee discussed the scheduling for the TV in the drop-in lounge in Clubhouse One. Um, this TV has been uh, a... Uh, source of conflict, let's say. Um, when it's in there, people seem to argue about what channel is on, what the volume should be, um, uh, and that type of thing. So there was some discussion and actually a decision at one point in time to remove the TV. Um, now it's been decided to keep the TV back in the drop-in lounge, have it with no uh, volume at all, but just close captures captioning and then have a different TV station for uh, every day of the week. Um, and so that uh, was voted on by the uh, CAC and uh, that decision will now go to the GRF board for consideration. Um, this committee also discussed requests from a club to add some improved projection capability at a cost to GRF of over $8,000. The committee voted against approving this request at this time. And the CAC, or Community Activities Committee, is planning to next meet on Tuesday, January 11th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. Next, we have the GRF Maintenance and Construction Committee, as well as possibly the Clubhouse Facilities Renovation Committee. Ralph, you have anything you want to share with us? Nothing new. I think our CEO did an excellent job of telling, the, giving you the status on, uh, on the Clubhouse One uh, renovation. Uh, other than that, our, our meeting is, uh, our next meeting is tomorrow afternoon, and then there is another one scheduled, I guess, in February, uh, and it will be here, uh, see, uh, tomorrow afternoon is, uh, I, as I recall, last time I looked at the schedule, it's tomorrow morning at 9.30 here in the uh, conference room, in the boardroom, and other than that, that's all I have at this time. I think... Uh, well, that's all. I have another question I'll ask Reza, but that's that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Ralph. Um, do you have any updates regarding the GRF Disaster Preparedness Task Force for us, SK? Yes, a GRF uh, Disaster Ta uh, Preparedness Task Force Committee meeting was held on November 28th, 9.30 a.m. in this boardroom. In that meeting, uh, DPTF committee discussed agenda items, those related to October 19th shakeout drill and antenna uh, installation status. The DTF, uh, DPTF was announced 7.2 earthquake for 1019 shakeout drill. Those drills was fo uh, focused on initial communication skills and the second code red system and the windshield survey for SOP. Uh, those has been evaluated uh, by them. Uh, that means uh, task force uh, uh, committee. And also talk about preparedness for man-made disasters such as active uh, shooter, disorderly conduct, and natural disasters such as EQ, tornado, and fires. Antenna installation is to be done by outside contractor, not inside uh, uh, our MC people. And also potential preparedness uh, training may need to be done quarterly. We're still discussing uh, about the how uh, often and how soon we're going to have that preparedness training. Next, it, uh, 
DPTF meeting is scheduled on January 30th, uh, 2024, 9.30 a.m. in this boardroom. Thank you. Great, thank you, SK. Uh, next, we have an update of the Information Technology Advisory Committee. This committee, known as ITAC, is overseeing the development and implementation of the new village-wide computer system, also known as ERP. The first pay phase of this ERP implementation will focus on our financial functions and activities. This first phase was scheduled to go live in February of 2024, um, but that has now been pushed back three months to May of 2024. This is mainly a result of pulling in scope from the next phase um, back into this first phase as uh, this pulled in scope seemed to be more related to financial functionally functionality than originally thought. That said, the overall ERP implementation effort is still scheduled to be completed by the end of 2024, since the second phase is smaller due to the scope from that phase being pulled into the first phase. Also, the overall ERP budget is not planning on changing as a result of these scope and implementation date changes. The ITAC is scheduled to next meet on Friday, December 29th. Next, we have the GRF Space Planning Committee. Andy? Okay, the GRF Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee evolved from a, an informal group of uh, mutual members and GRF members. So this is an official committee now, and we're meeting in the boardroom going forward. Uh, GRF President Robinson, in this initial meeting, uh, defined some parameters of moving forward. And with a lot of focus on needs, versus wants, and accumulation of data versus opinions. And so now we have a framework, and we expect uh, a lot of participation from affected parties. The next meeting will be held January 3rd, 2024, in the boardroom at 1.30 p.m. Great. Thanks, Andy. And finally, the following GRF committees have not met since the last third board meeting of November 21st, so there are no updates for these. The GRF website ad hoc committee, which last met on May 22nd, and the date and time of its next meeting is to be determined. The GRF broadband ad hoc committee last met on November 20th, and the date and time of its next meeting is to be determined. The GRF mobility and vehicles committee last met on November 6th, and is scheduled to next meet on Wednesday, February 7th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Landscape Committee last met on November 8th and is scheduled to next to meet on Wednesday, February 14th. Looks like Valentine's Day at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Media and Communications Committee last met on September 18th and is scheduled to next meet on Monday, January 15th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Finance Committee last met on October 18th and is scheduled to next meet tomorrow, Wednesday, December 20th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. The GRF Security and Community Access Committee last met on October 25th and is scheduled to next meet on Wednesday, February 28th at 1.30 p.m. here in the boardroom. And finally, the Laguna Woods Village traffic hearings last met on November 15th and is scheduled to next meet on Wednesday, January 7th. So that concludes our committee reports. We're now at agenda item 15, um, which is for the board to note any items they would like to be discussed at a future board meeting. So far on our list, we have one item that we today put on 28 day member review and comment, and that is to uh, discuss and potentially approve the new barbecue policy. We also have a request from a board member to someday discuss traffic rules and regulations, most specifically the registered vehicle policy. Um, is there any other items that anyone would, would like to be considered to be added to a future monthly open board meeting? Jim? I would like to add to item uh, the traffic rules and regulations, item 15, uh, that we actually review because we've adopted the whole California vehicle code as a whole. And there's a lot of parts of it that don't apply to our village. You know, the one being uh, registration. And the reason for this and the reason I'm bringing it up is 
we kind of spin our wheels if we go mark up and write up for registration because we don't receive funding for violations from that kind of thing. Plus, we waste a lot of staff time. So the only time we should even be looking at registration is when we have a vehicle reported as abandoned or possibly abandoned. Otherwise, we're spinning our wheels. We're creating work that basically doesn't resolve anything, especially if the Department of Motor Vehicles is two or three months behind on getting the registration stickers out to people, which has been the case on certain occasions. But I think there's a lot more in the vehicle code that doesn't apply to our village that we could redline a whole bunch of it so that we aren't enforcing things and spending staff time on something that accomplishes nothing. Okay, sounds good, thank you. Moon? But thanks. Any other comments or suggestions for future agenda items? All right. All right. So um, it's now 11.05. Reza, it must be you. This is uh, the fastest we've uh, uh, ever finished board meeting <laughs> in, in my near memory. Okay, so I have one hour? <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> um, but we have an agenda item, 12D, that's scheduled uh, because there's uh, some legal potential legal, legal aspects scheduled for 1130. Um, so I think what we will, yep, so go ahead, Paul. I'm sorry, do you want to do director comments after that item? Uh, or? Probably, okay. just in case the sure. directors have, yes, so, so I'm thinking I will do that. So I'm thinking we might just go on a recess here for 20 minutes. So I need you all back in here by 1125 so that we're ready to go at 1130. Um, and We'll take that item then. Thank you.
Go ahead and get started since we're here. Our final new business agenda 
Item is 12D, and it is for the board to hear information about a damage restoration situation at Manor 4003 3G. Normally, damage restoration hearings are done in closed session, but Mr. Katz requested we hold this in open session, which we're happy to accommodate. Steve, why don't you come sit up here next to Jim? Um, I believe Mrs. Chavarria from staff has an overview of the situation to share with the board before we hear from Mr. Katz. Good morning, President Laws and members of the board. We're here to ask that the board evaluate responsibility for damage to mutual controlled property from an event that occurred in 2020. Um, as you're aware, we're in the process of reconciling a backlog of damage restoration cases, and Manor 4003 3G is among the list of cases that may be responsible for providing a reimbursement to third mutual uh, for costs that you incurred during a restoration event that occurred on July 23rd, 2020. I'm going to read a summary of the background and a bit of discussion um, before Mr. Katz comes up to the podium. Mr. Sylvan Katz owned two manors in Third Mutual, Manor 4003 3G, where Mr. Katz also resided, and Manor 4003 3F. Mr. Sylvan Katz passed away on January 29, 2022. At that time, his son, Mr. Randolph Katz, became the successor trustee of Manor 3F and later the executor of Manor 3G. On July 23, 2020, the owner-occupant of Manor 4003 1G reported water leaking out of the master bathroom fan from an unknown source. Mutual's plumbing staff responded and initiated a leak investigation, inspecting and contacting the residents in the two manors directly above, which are 2G and 3G. Plumbing staff determined that the resident in Manor 3G left the faucet running in the master bathroom basin which then overflowed and caused water damage to Manners 2G and 1G. The Mutuals Damage Restoration Coordinator inspected uh, the Manners below, which are 1G and 2G, and restoration services were initiated as described in the attachments uh, in the agenda packet, items 2, 3, and 4. After the initial leak investigation, Mr. Sylvan Katz refused to let the Damage Restoration Coordinator or any restoration vendors inside his manor. The Compliance Division sent two requests to Mr. Sylvan Katz asking him to comply, and when those were unsuccessful, a disciplinary hearing was held on September 10, 2020. Additionally, a request was sent to Social Services to see if they could help Mr. Katz better understand the restoration process and next steps, as he had a history of noncompliance. On September 10, 2020, the Board did make a determination um, to fine um, Mr. Katz $150 if he did not comply. That was held in abeyance uh, since he did end up complying and staff gained entry to the manor on September 23rd, 2020. We were able to then um, perfect, uh, perform a visual inspection. Um, however, it had been two months uh, since the basin had overflowed and all surfaces in manor 3G were dry and no secondary damages were visible at that time. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, staff vacancies, and subsequent malware attack on Laguna Woods Village, Third Mutual was unable to process responsibility evaluations for damage restoration events for quite some time. On September 25th, the Mutual issued a letter to Executor Randolph Katz reserving its right to pursue recovery of all costs relative to the above-mentioned event. Third Mutual Resolution 03-1768, adopted on June 20th, 2017, which is also known as your damage restoration policy, states that the owner resident is responsible for their personal property alterations and improvements and for damage caused to a unit by the owner, guest, or resident negligence. And in compliance with Civil Code 5855, Randall Katz was noticed for this hearing before the Board of Directors and you will review the case in the presence of legal counsel to determine responsibility for damages to mutual controlled property. The total damages, as you can see on page 2 of 22 of your agenda item, is $7,814.32. Any questions for me before I turn the podium over? 
Mm-hmm. When did we, or Third Mutual, establish the, the, the cause of the problem? Is that after his death or before his death? That was on the date that it was reported by Manor 1G. The plumbing uh, staff um, investigated the leak in <coughs> 1G. Then they went up to 2G to see that they were affected. And then they went up to Manor 3G and spoke to Mr. Sylvan Katz, who said that he had left the faucet running by accident. So he did say before his death, it was his fault. Well, I don't know if he said the words, it was my fault, but he told the plumbing uh, staff member that the faucet was left running by accident. And that note is mentioned in the plumbing statement, um, which is attachment one. Hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. Shepard-Maria? All right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Katz. Um, Good morning. uh, Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, as, 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 as per the, beep, beep. the letter you got, you have five minutes to address the board. I will try to speak more slowly than I normally do. Okay. If I start speaking too quickly, just throw something at me and I will duck and uh, slow down. Okay. Uh, as you know, my name is Randy Katz. I appreciate the time we have this morning. I'll see if I can be done in four minutes and 47 seconds. Uh, Sylvan was my father. Uh, as, as we know, he passed away at the end of January 2022. And I am the executor of his estate. Um, I'm his only son and his only child, and so everything falls on me. Ta-da! I want to think about three things with you guys today. Uh, The first is what we have in terms of an alleged incident. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. And I want to think about two other things which are in the packets before you, which are the statutes of limitations that, uh, that I think rule where we may end up wanting to go. Uh, if I think about the first, it's, uh, on TV you always hear the words hearsay, and, and, and hearsay basically means a, a, an out-of-court statement, this isn't really court, but close enough, an out-of-court statement that is introduced for the truth of the matter asserted. What we have here is we have Sylvan saying something, I don't know what, and unless we have a, you know, a Ouija board, we can't find out for sure. Uh, I wasn't there either. Uh, the, the plumbing folks may have heard things, but they're not here to testify, and so... If I were playing lawyer, I am one, but I'm not playing lawyer right now. I'm just the executor. I would talk about hearsay. But what I really want to talk about are the two things, one of which is, kind of, uh, is important in terms of where you came up, and that's statutes of limitations. And the statute of limitations basically say from the time that something occurs, how long can it go before it becomes stale, if you will? And so in the packets in front of you, and my printer is thanks you very much for working overtime last night, uh, in the packets in front of you, you'll see two, uh, two items. One is a one-year statute, and the other is a three-year statute. The code sections provide that if there's a claim to be made against an estate, it has to be made within a year of when the, inst- uh, when the decedent became a decedent, right? After that, uh, the executor can say, no, thank you. I'm the executor, and I'm really polite, but I would say, no, thank you. And you'll see in there the statutes, and you'll also see in there, although it's not fully relevant, the time frame within which Third Mutual was notified of my father's passing, uh, which was more than a year ago, plus, plus, plus. And so if you feel like flipping through all that fine stuff, you can make me feel good because I did work. And if you don't, that's fine too. But statute of limitation number one is a one-year statute, which expired, no pun intended, a year after Silva did. Statute of limitations number two is independently of his passing, there's a three-year statute, with respect to property damage. Damage allegedly occurs here, went to the third year. Beyond that, claims cannot be made uh, for property damage. Now, one of the things that was in the staff report was, you know, there was this COVID, and we had staffing shortages, and we also had a a hack, yikes. Um, I want to think about COVID specifically. Staffing shortages are unfortunately part of what works in my office, works with you guys, and they're just Yesterday we had lots of people, today not so much. How come? I don't know. Uh, and and, and uh, the, um, the, the issue with the computers I really can't speak to. The state legislature and the California Rules of Court said, yeah, COVID is a problem, and because things get sort of backed up, there is then a, was a, an up to six-month extension for when the statute of limitations would expire. And you'll see that in there, I think, as, as probably Exhibit L. Um, because this alleged event occurred during the April through October time period, 
you start with the date of the alleged uh, incident, which is July 23. You run through to April 1, I'm uh, sorry, October 1. You have about 70 days. And so if I then think about the three-year statute, which ordinarily would expire on J July 23 of this year, I add 70 days to that. We're now in October 1, which is also in the rearview mirror. So on the three-year statute, including the extra time that the uh, court rules provided, again, it's, it's, it's too late. So that's all I got for you. You got a little hearsay. He's been dead for more than a year. Yeah, right, I know. Uh, and we have the three-year statute running. So. And there's lots of reading material there, so you, know, you can uh, use it however you'd like. Okay, great, thank you. Great. Questions, comments? Yeah, any questions from members of the board for Mr. Katz? You, do you have the question? Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, uh, good morning. I'm Steve Roseman. I'm general counsel for Third Mutual. Uh, hey, Steve, nice to meet you. Is it, yes, it is good morning. Still, still barely, but we got there. Uh, a couple of questions I have, sure. and, and just so you understand procedurally, the board will then meet, deliberate, and discuss and get back to you. Thank you for turning on my microphone. Um, <laughs> have you looked at the CCNRs yes. at all for the committee? Do you? believe that the CCNRs govern as far as obligations to ensure no nuisance or other damage is caused to the other units. And if you d did look at that and that provision, do you agree that potentially a four-year statute of limitations applies with regard to a breach of a written document, which effectively is what the CCNRs are? Uh, I did look at it. I disagree with you that it's a breach of a written document. The breach occurred, if there were one, when my father apparently, supposedly, left the water on too long. That's the breach if there were one, and that's a three-year statute. That's the property damage statute. Yes. But if there's a violation of the governing documents for action that your late father did, it could be argued that the CCNRs are the applicable document that governs what his obligations are not to create any form of nuisance as set forth under Article 3, Section 6 of the CCNRs. And if that is the case, if it is triggering a violation in the governing documents, four years run from the date of the violation in order to take action for the breach of the CCNRs, which effectively still gives us another, Number including the COVID time period, probably enough time within that time period. I understand. I would suggest respectfully that the gravamen of the issue is the water. But for the water, there would be no discussion about nuisance and four-year statute. But separately from that, we have the fact that he's been buried now for a year and a half. Plus. The issue with regard to the estate that's a discussion. I haven't researched that topic, and that's something we could look into. But the only reason I raise this other issue is yeah. because whenever we move to enforce by way of an individual special assessment, um, which is set forth in Article 9 of section, and Section 3 of the CCNRs, any damages caused by the, the, the actions of an owner are enforced under the CCNR provision, which gives us the authority then to impose an individual assess special assessment for recovery of that damage. And that's the mechanism that associations have been using for many, many years. The attempt to argue the property damage statute is trying to circumvent the CCNRs, which are the governing documents which were recorded, which bind the owner to the obligations to not do the actions that occurred. I want to address the hearsay and then I'll, I'll let you respond on the hearsay issue. Uh, hearsay doesn't really apply within these hearings. Um, but I don't think, from our understanding, there's a dispute as to what the cause of the water was, primarily because once it was turned off and once it stopped running, there was no evidence that there was an ongoing leak, additional problems, no repairs needed to be made to the unit. So I think. On a, on a balance of probabilities, the evidence seems to be quite clear that the cause of it was from, from um, what, you know, what was presented as far as the bath, uh, bathroom basin overflowing or left running. But I, I don't think that's as much um, of a discussion or a debate than the issue associated with whether the CCNRs govern as far as our entitlement to recovery as against the three-year property. Would you like to test it in the system? Maybe it'll be interesting to see how the law rules uh, on that subject. But I tell you, we have been doing it for many, many years, enforcing the, um, the individual special assessment provision for recovery of these damages to the common area pursuant to the CCNRs. And uh, respectfully, I understand your position. I'm not certain I agree, but that's certainly something the board can, can discuss. Uh, again, separate from the, uh, the one-year statute, uh, that ran from my father's passing a year and two-thirds ago now. Good. Okay. 
Okay, thanks. Jules, you have a comment or question? Uh, a, I had a, 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 a question before as to, uh, which was uh, essentially Mr. Katz's question about hearsay. Uh, but I also agree with Steve that it is much more likely than not that the uh, uh, damage was done simply as it was uh, described uh, in, in the uh, complaint. Uh, I also have no question uh, as to how this board is probably <laughs> going to decide because uh, the issue uh, itself uh, probably uh, will ultimately be decided uh, in a court of law. <laughs> in other words, trying to uh, argue before uh, 11 uh, laymen uh, what the law is on a very interesting uh, legal question is probably hopeless. But uh, I have no further comments. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Moon, you have something you'd like to say? Uh, it appeared to me as a layman, not the legal authority, the cause was done by upstairs the third floor and the running water, broken pipe, whatever. And it draining down second floor, third floor. Third floor felt there's a water damage, so they went up. The problem here was the third floor resident refused to let the people in. And then eventually, whatever the process, they were able to get in and they fixed it. Meanwhile, the third floor resident felt his problem, he closed it. And then we had a long duration of a period, it dried out. The fact is that right now, he passed away two years later. And then now his son are claiming this legal technical issue. This is uh, the, uh, Steve say differently about CCNR or states of limitation, whatever. So we are, I'm not responsible because of legal technical issue. As a layman and also board member of this third mutual, to me, Whoever responsible party have to be responsible. Let me tell you one thing, one other thing. Right now we are recuperating the money we spend the third mutual to dry them out the second floor, third floor. But after that, second floor resident, third floor resident had to do further work. Okay, they have to do whatever they because the the restoration doesn't do completely. So you may end up second floor and first floor, they may pursue their reimbursement to you. Okay, I had the same situation in my situation. I took them to the small court, so I won. Okay, so the small court said, whoever causing party is responsible. They're very simple judgment. So to me, no matter how, I don't know your, your background of legal or that, but as a community member responsible in living here, have to be responsible when I cause you some damage to some other members. Thank you. Thank you. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Brad? I'm sorry for your father's passing. Did he have insurance? He did. I've talked to the insurance company. The insurance company said three-year statute, we're not paying. Independent of anything else. The first thing that I did was to contact the folks at um, Liberty. You can sing the song now for you, right? Right. Uh, and, and I said, here's the issue. Here's the stuff. And they wrote back and said, three years, so sorry. Steve, do we have recourse with the insurance? Steve, would, would we have recourse with the insurance? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. What, 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 yeah, the insurance, did he not tender it to the insurance company at the time of the incident? I have no way of knowing. Okay. Uh, but but having, having said that, 
my supposition is that when this incident occurred, by the way, I can't figure out how one can turn the faucet on a, ba a bathroom basin and have enough water go down that we're having a meeting today, but that's something that I, I'm, not, I'm not a plumber, so I don't get it. But the answer to your question is I don't know that he did because at that point in time, I don't know that he had knowledge that it was going to be a $2 expense or a million dollar expense or anything in between. So I'm not sure he would have had anything to tender anyway, but I'm making that up. Right. Yeah, uh, that's if ever there was speculation, that's it, right? Even better than the hearsay. Exactly. Um, you know, there is one other thing, and I, I, I know you quoted certain sections from the uh, CCP 366.2, but it talks about certain exceptions, and I don't have a copy of the code here to have a look at that, but I don't know what the exception. Do you know when you notified the mutual that he had passed your dad? Uh, that'll be in packet number one. Okay. And that would have been... February or March of this year in which he passed. Okay. Uh, my hope is, by the way, with respect to the, uh, the, what you were mentioning, that the, at least as I was deeming them to be relevant, the relevant exceptions uh, were, were scanned and, and put in the packet as well. Okay. So I, again, I'm hopeful that I, I covered everything. If, if I didn't, uh, it's sort of on my bad, but it's not trying to mislead anybody, obviously. Okay. Okay. Great, thank you. Any other questions, comments? Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm just curious about the statute of limitations in our package, and I don't know where, who provided this, if it was yourself or our staff. Does it have the, a bunch of blue sheets in it? Mr. Katz. Statute of limitations doesn't mean anything. So let, let, me, let, me, let me try to answer your question. If we are looking at about statute of limitations, is Cliff with a bunch of blue sheets, then I provided it. If it is not Cliff with blue sheets, then staff must have. Okay. I, I see a three-year rule plus 70 days. Yes. And I have a letter here, a copy of a letter, dated September 25th, 2023, which is six days before the October 1st, 2023, interpretation of the California statute. Uh, when, when, did you get, when did you get effective notice of the issue? So in the packet, I've got a copy of each of the letters I received from, from the mutual. The first one was, I think, near the end of August then near the end of September, and then in November. Okay, but, and the August the, one, which I, don't, I can't see here, I haven't found it. Sure. Was there a dollar amount listed? No. In the September 25th one, there was a dollar amount listed, which is somewhat different than the final, but there is a dollar amount. That's okay. correct, yes. Yes, okay, thank you. Yes, yeah. and, and my hope is uh, that if I scanned everything properly and assemble all the past couple of days, when you go through that packet, you'll see the letter, each of them, and you'll see all the attachments that came with them, except for the staff report, where it's merely the staff report without the attachments. Okay. I, I tried to be, you know, comprehensive. For you and just as going for it, could you, uh, Mr. Katz, could you come a little closer to the mic? It's kind of hard to hear you. Is this better? It's a little better. How about that? <laughs> okay. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. I uh, just wanted to inform you that we have had, even though the three-year statute of limitations from the insurance companies, once the judgment is made, then our uh, insurance person here on staff works with these insurance companies, and a lot of times they'll waive that three-year limitation. So there is a possibility that it can still be done. Did, did you actually file a claim so that they actually had to open something up? I did. Is that, is that it, yes? That's yes. No, I, I, let me get closer. Let me swallow the mic. Um, I, I filed a claim. There's a claim number, and I provided to the insurance folks on the East Coast essentially everything that I've been provided with by you guys. Okay. So they, they have, they've collected the whole set. Uh, what they're doing with it right now is uh, sitting on their thumbs. Right. But with that same information and that claim number given to our person, they can sometimes work with the insurance companies to get them to cover. Understood. Thank you for Just that. Just want to let you know that. I appreciate that. Okay. Any other comments? Boom. Yeah. <clears throat> I found out a main resident had an insurance company, and they are denying it many other reasons. And uh, so to me, you have insurance, you have a big brother behind you, it doesn't matter. Whoever has, is responsible, guilty, he is responsible for that damage. And uh, how he recuperate from insurance company or big brothers is his own issue. And uh, to me here, you brought up this board. So we have a right to or duty to 
whatever we decided the proper way. And if you don't agree with it, you can take your limitation, state or superior court or supreme court, whatever you want to do. That's the way I look at things. Okay, thank you. My, my sense is that no matter how we all end up here, the Supreme Court is not going to be interested in this particular case. <laughs> just a thought. I, I'm going to ask you, just, can I ask, you, ask another question? Sure. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I'm a pragmatic attorney, obviously, and I'm looking to find some form of resolution over here. You know, the difficulty is that the association or the mutual has an obligation to enforce their governing documents. The difficulty here is that if we proceed with an action to recover it, your argument would be the negligence theory on a statute of limitations. Our argument is a breach of the CCNRs. And so my question to you is, are you amenable to any discussion for resolution or are you stuck hard and fast in your position with regard to statute of limitations is run and you're not willing to reimburse the, the mutual for any damages associated with this action? And I only raise this issue because if it can be resolved, I'd like to. There's an attorney's fees provision in the CCNRs that allow recovery if it's pursued, pursuant to that. Under the negligence uh, cause of action, uh, which the statute has run, there's no attorney's fees provision, obviously. Um, so my question is, and I'm not speaking on behalf of the board, I want to be clear, I'm only broaching the subject to have a healthy discussion with you in that regard. Um, is that something you would be amenable to discussing or resolving? Uh, a couple of thoughts. Uh, one, although I'm the executor of my father's estate, um, I need to have serious another set of serious conversations with my two kids because they're the ones at the end of the day who, um, who are the economic hotshots, if you will. So I need to talk to them about it. Um, if, they're, if I could speak for them, I would suspect that they would say, understanding the push and pull of the three years versus four year statute, uh, that they would be willing to entertain something once we've all come to a conclusion as to whether there's an argument, lots of arguments or no argument with respect to the one year statute. Because if the one year statute is there like, like a wall, then my suspicion is they would say no thanks. On the other hand, if there is some conversation that we should have, either as a civil multiple or you and I, about the one year statute, then we can certainly visit that. But I, I appreciate the thought though, absolutely. Thank you. Where's I, I, I just have one question. First, sorry about your loss. Thank you very I much. I just, uh, I'm wondering, you were aware that your father was informed about this situation before he passed? The first I was aware of any of this was the August, I think, 25 letter in your packet uh, that said there might be a problem here. So I called and spoke to a really nice person and said, it's been three years, what am I thinking about? And she said, well, We'll get back to you if there's an issue in the near term. Tick, 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 and a month later. So I had no clue about it until, uh, until I started getting communications but, from, from the but board. But there is internally documentation from third mutual to the manor owner, which your father, before you were informed of the situation, right? There would have to be because... Okay, that's, that's my point. So, but, 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 but I don't know, not to cut you off, but I think I just did, and I apologize. No, what, what, what I asked for when this started going down this path from staff was a copy of everything that I characterized in the file. The, the first person with whom I had conversations, I will tell you it was not as pleasant experience as this has been, nor as pleasant as it's been with Lori. And so when I said the file, the initial question was, well, what's the file? I figured, really? So we go through all that stuff, and then it was, well, I, Nicole Cruz, don't have the file. It's gonna be somewhere else. You can't get it because it's private. And around and around we went. So whatever is in the packet you have is the sum total of everything I'm aware of. And the only thing I'm aware of in the packet was on September, I think it's 23, uh, when, uh, when the folks went back upstairs to see Sylvan. And it appears he sort of scratched out his initials there. That's the only thing I'm aware of that would have been deemed to be a communication between you guys and, and your folks and my father. <sighs> If there's more stuff, I'd be delighted to see it, yeah. but I don't know now, anymore. Do you believe that if there was a claim against your father before he passed, that transferred to the state? The only claim I'm aware of was, as Lori indicated, the $150 contingent fine. But I don't think I'm answering your question, am I? Yeah, my question is, if there is claim against the state yep. before 
the individual passed, yeah. does, is the state responsible? A statute of limitations doesn't apply. So that's what I'm saying. If you agree with that, then I guess then you can negotiate. Uh, I'm not certain. I, I think I understand what you're saying, and I don't agree. Well, but I, but I hear you. What did you say? I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize for this. What, what I said uh, to, to Reza was I hear what he's saying, yes. I, but I disagree. Oh, you said you disagree? Disagree, right. Because, and, and let me restate it to make sure I'm disagreeing with what I, thought you heard, what I thought I heard you say. What I thought I heard you say was if there were a claim against my father before he passed away, yes. does that claim continue in force today as against his estate? Yes. And, and the answer is... If nothing else, by virtue of the statute of limitations, I disagree. And so that's sort of where we are. Moon? Yeah. The incident happened, and then about two years he passed away almost, right? There was a lot of interactions, and uh, compliance people went in, social security people went in, and so many transactions between that. Second one is... Uh, uh, the suggestion of Stevens, uh, the negotiation or the, the money issues. This is a 7,800, not a huge Checking. amount of money. I don't like to negotiate one cent. Okay. With, with, with respect, ignoring the negotiations aspect of it, what I thought I heard you say was there was a lot of interaction during the two years between when the incident allegedly occurred, a year and a half, and when he passed away. And again, to, to, to Reza's point, I'm not aware of any interaction other than what's been provided to me, uh, which is now in, in the packets I provided to, to you all. So if there's more interaction, part of the file, I think it would be helpful if I could see that, those other pieces of paper. The cause was uh, your father was dealing with the third mutual. That has nothing to do with that message was went to you directly, legally, whatever. The problem was there. And how he dealt with it is your father's problem. And if your father hold it, doesn't tell all the details to son or write it down, that doesn't, that does not give you any excuse because the problem was there. With respect, I'm not looking for an excuse, but what I am suggesting is if there are other documents, memoranda of interactions that I've not been provided with, that you guys have been, I would like to see them. I'm not aware of anything else other than what's in the packet because that's what's been provided to me by, by Lori and the folks on, the, on staff. But I understand what you're saying. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Katz. Oops. I just have one last question. Have you confirmed, confirmed with liter Liberty Mutual that there was no claim ever made oh, with his insurance I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I did not. When I made the claim, here we go, sorry. When, when, I, when I made the claim a few months ago, I did not hear from them, oh, look, it's back. But I can certainly confirm. I understand what you're saying. Okay. But I'm just curious yeah. if, to know if your father might have actually filed a claim with Liberty Mutual that you're not aware of. I, 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 I don't know, but I, but I understand what you're saying, and I'll find out. Okay. And then the second thing is more for Steve. Can insurance companies write policies that violate CCNRs? Can insurance companies write policies that violate CCNRs? Well, yeah, let me put the microphone on there. Oh, that's a very broad question. The real question is when they wrote the policy, they should be provided with a copy of CCNRs to see if it's in compliance. But it's a legal question that when we go into executive session, let's discuss that further uh, okay. in that regard. Thank you. All right. So thank you for taking the time to come share your perspective with us and bringing us all this documentation. Thank you, uh, Lori, as well. Um, you know, the board will you know, take this to closed session, deliberate, and you will hear from us within 15 days what we've decided. Perfect. Thank you for the time this morning. And I'm thanks. glad we were able to express lots of views. I think we were. And uh, I'm hopeful it will turn out. Uh, Steve, is there any way I can get a hold of you? Absolutely. Uh, I'll give you, let me give you one of my business cards. That'd be great. Okay. All right. Okay. And uh, thanks again, board, for the discussion. Appreciate it. We're going to move on to agenda item 16, which is director's comments, uh, final director's comments. Uh, uh, Brad, anything further you want to share today? No. Okay. SK? 
No. Okay. Moon? No. All right. Jim? No. Chris? No. Thank you. Okay. Andy? Reza? Well, this is the last meeting of the board for this year, so I wish everyone <laughs> a happy new year. <laughs> Merry Christmas and happy new year. <laughs> it's the last one you know of. <laughs> this day and time. All right, staff, anything? I'm around here. Ralph and Jules. I can get them too. Okay, yeah, Jules, anything you have want to say? Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to get back to the question that was raised by Jim Southworth. Uh, I disagree wholly with oh, him as to session. who owns the tree. On the other hand, when so, someone comes along, clearly that tree belongs to everybody. And if one person comes along, particularly someone that's not a member, and strips it, that's plain old ordinary larceny. And although it's probably going to be difficult to prosecute, the point is that Jim has an excellent claim. The point is that somebody simply stole all our fruit. Happy New Year, everybody, and Merry Christmas. Great. Thanks, Jules. Ralph, any final comments? Merry, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and enjoy your lunch. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you all. And uh, with that, uh, meeting of our uh, business of our open meeting has now been concluded. This time, the monthly board meeting will recess for... 10 minutes um, and then move to executive committee and executive session. Thank you very much.